Thank you. So I'm going to tell you two stories today. Uh, one's very short, uh, basically an introduction about who I am and what I do. The other is very long. In fact, it's the longest and most rich story on earth. I'll get to that one in a minute. Um, so my short story begins uh, very early in my life. I was born and raised here in Hawaii. And my very earliest childhood memories all are about my fascination for fishes. Uh, yes, fishes. I uh, actually learned how to snorkel at the very northern end of Kailua Bay, directly in front of the house where President Obama and his family spend every Christmas. And I used to catch aquarium fish out there for my home aquariums. But um, as I was a graduate student, when I was about 19 years old, I actually, there I am. <laughs> I had the very good fortune of um, living in Palau, uh, which is a very wonderful place for a fish nerd to live. Next slide. And in Palau, I had the very good fortune of meeting this man, Dr. John E. Randall, known to his friends and colleagues as Jack. Now, Jack is, has spent most of his career at Bishop Museum here in Honolulu working on fishes. In fact, he's the uber fish nerd of all time. Um, he's named uh, more new species of coral reef fishes than anybody else in history, which is pretty amazing. Now, the reason why Jack was so successful in this endeavor is that he came along in history when scuba was a new technology. and He was the first person to be able to exploit this technology to explore coral reefs in a way that they had never been explored before. Um, now, in fact, when I met up with Jack in Palau when I was 19 years old, uh, he had pretty much nailed every new species there was. I'm not nailed in that sense, but nailed in the sense of <laughs> discovery every new species of fishes there was to be found out there. And, and it was very hard for a young ichthyologist like myself to try to, try to keep pace. Um, so the only way I was able to find new species, if I wanted to go find new species, was to dive outside the realm of where scuba allowed Jack to go, about 200 feet down. Um, if I wanted to find new species, I had to go beyond this depth, into this twilight zone, uh, well below those depths. Now, in my zeal to find new species of fishes, I, um, well, I picked a fight with the laws of physics, and the law won. Um, about a couple of days after this photograph was taken, I ended up having a very severe case of decompression sickness, also known as the bends. I was quadriplegic. It took me almost a year before I could walk normally again. So that was a pretty serious uh, moment in my life. Um, the doctors had told me never dive again. Um, but uh, the, the allure, the, the thrill of discovery and exploration had left an impression far deeper than the score, scars on my spinal cord. And so I decided that um, I just, this is what my calling in life, was to explore coral reefs down deep. Now, notwithstanding what I look like in this photograph, I wasn't a complete idiot. <laughs> I actually knew enough to know that diving deep was crazy. And so I started thinking about ways I could do it a little more safely. High, -tech, high technology scuba, advanced technology that allows you to go deeper and stay longer uh, and, and, and go safely more so than, than scuba allows you to go. And specifically, I was looking at these closed circuit mixed gas electronically controlled rebreathers. And in fact, starting in the 1990s, I got very much involved with designing and development and testing these new breathers and coming up with protocols for using them for scientific purposes to explore coral reefs. So over the past two decades or so since, we've taken this technology all across the Pacific to dozens of localities. And during these expeditions, we've uncovered a treasure trove of new discoveries. What you're seeing right now is only a sample of what we've found. We've found over 100 new species of fishes so far. But what's really remarkable is that if you look at how much time we actually spend exploring, we're up to 12 new species of fishes discovered per hour of exploration time, which is pretty remarkable. There's nowhere else in the world you can go and find anywhere near that many new vertebrate species that quickly. So we estimate that there are probably about one third of all coral reef fishes are still waiting to be discovered. This is a group we thought we had pretty much figured out, uh, but they're still waiting down there for new discoveries. Now, discovery is only part of, the pro part of the process. The other part of the process is documentation. So every new species has to be very carefully examined and properly described in a scientific publication, given a, a Latin name, a scientific name, according to rules that have been around for 250 years. And this is where another part of my job comes into play. So I spend most of my time at Bishop Museum sitting in this office, surrounded by computer displays. As you can see, the only windows in my office are the ones designed by Microsoft. <laughs> and I, basically what I do for the museum is I, I design computer database systems. I develop and program computer database systems that allow us to organize biodiversity information 
in a way that can be accessed. And part of that is trying to change the way that these new species are described. So instead of printing just these paper documents that the way it's been done for 250 years, we're building these electronic content-rich documents with many hyperlinks that, that blow out into all these websites around the world. So that's always exciting. So now I'm going to go on to my second story that I'm going to tell. And this story I'm actually going to tell backwards. I'm going to start at the ending of the story and work backwards to the beginning of the story. So the ending of the story takes place a little, little less than 400 feet deep in the western Indian Ocean, where two large vertebrates meet each other. <laughs> the vertebrate on the left I've already introduced you to. That's me. The vertebrate on the right is a coelacanth, Latimeria columni, living fossil, very famous fish, very interesting fish. Now, working backwards through this story in time, I was born about 40 years ago, a little over 40 years ago. These are my parents. And coelacanths, as it happened, live about the same length as humans do, so we can just sort of speculate that it was also born of parents about 40 years ago. So let's go back another power of 10, uh, an order of magnitude. Let's go back 400 years ago. Now, I can trace my own lineage through my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and so on and so on and so forth, all the way back for 20 generations, 400 years, and eventually I end up with this guy. His name was Miles Standish. He came to North America aboard the Mayflower, and he was the first elected commander of the new colony in Plymouth. Now, the coelacanth can also trace its lineage. It had a grandfather and a great-grandfather, and so on and so on and so forth, going back 400 years. Now, I don't think its ancestor was aboard the Mayflower, but it was probably living deep in the waters off the Western Indian Ocean. So let's take this back another power of 10. Let's go back 200 generations, 4,000 years. My ancestor most likely was walking around in Mesopotamia. Look, might have looked something like that. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, and the coelacanth also had an ancestor that lived that long ago. Generation after generation, we can trace it back. And it probably looked something like that, and it probably lived somewhere in what was then the Western Indian Ocean. Let's go another power of 10. So now we're talking about 2,000 generations, 40,000 years. My ancestors were probably among the first colonizers of what is now Europe, coming out of northern Africa using sophisticated stone tools. And the coelacanth ancestor that long ago was probably still a coelacanth. Let's go another power of 10. 400,000 years ago is about the time that my ancestors first began harnessing uh, fire, controlling fire, uh, major advancement in human evolution. Not so much to say about the coelacanth side of the story. <laughs> Let's go another power of 10, four million years ago. This is the dawn of human species on the planet. This is Australopithecus, a uh, famous example of Australopithecus is Lucy, uh, one of the earliest human ancestors, four million years ago, wandering around northern Africa. And swimming off, somewhere off the western Africa was a coelacanth. Still going. Now let's try 40 million years ago. 40 million years ago, my ancestor probably looked something like that. I don't know but it probably looked a little bit like that. And it's not just my ancestor. This was also the ancestor of all modern lemurs and monkeys and the great apes. And the coelacanth looked like a coelacanth. Now, at this point, you're probably a little bit skeptical. How do I know that that coelacanth really looked like that 40 million years ago? I actually, believe it or not, I have a pretty good confidence that it did. And the reason is there are actually two living coelacanths. And the second one lives in Indonesia. And it looks almost identical to the one off, off South Africa in all respects, uh, but the genetic studies show that they separated about 30 to 40 million years ago. So if both of these things that look almost identical separated that long ago, it's very likely that their ancestor 40 million years ago looked the same. Another power of 10, we're now going back 400 million years ago. And finally we find the common ancestor between those two vertebrates that met off of uh, South Africa 400 feet deep. And in fact, it's not just my, my ancestor and the coelacanth's ancestor, it was the ancestor of all terrestrial vertebrates. Now, to give you a sense for the enormity of time we're talking about here, the entire age of dinosaurs fits in right about there. We're talking about a lot of time. Remember, each step along the way has been a power of 10. But with the story's not over yet, or I should say the story hasn't begun yet. Going back to the very beginning of the story, we have to go another power of 10. Four billion years ago is when life began on this planet. It's absolutely amazing to think about how long it's been here. What's truly amazing is to think that every species on this thing shares a common ancestor. Going back generation after generation after generation after generation. 
as far as we know, there is something on the order of about 10 to 30 million species on this planet. And every single one of them, every living thing, humans, dinosaurs, birds, plants, bacteria, everything can trace its ancestry back one generation after another, after another, after another for four billion years. That's absolutely amazing. Think about it for a minute. That means that every living thing is the product of an absolutely unbroken sequence of reproductive events, a four billion year old chain that's not missing a single link. Truly incredible. So if a distant traveler were to come to our solar system and look at these uh, orbs, one of them would stand out. Can you guess which one? It's not the biggest, it's not the smallest, it's not the one with the cool rings on it. So what is it about Earth that's really different from all the planets in our solar system? Now the obvious answer is, well, lots of liquid water, but liquid water is not really all that special in the universe, as we're learning more and more, we found out this morning, perhaps. Um, it's not even that unique in our own solar system. Various moons of these planets have liquid water. What really sets Earth apart from all the other planets in our solar system, and possibly most other planetary systems in our galaxy, we don't know yet, um, is the incredible richness of biodiversity that lives there. That's what makes this planet stand out from the others. So when you think about what are all of these, these living organisms, really every species is like a book. It's been written and rewritten, edited and re-edited over the course of four billion years. Global biodiversity is Earth's greatest library. And each one of these books is a unique story, millions of volumes. And these aren't just any old stories. They're actually, well, first of all, they're nonfiction stories. And more interestingly, they're stories of survival. These are the stories of successful navigations over four billion years of life and death. These are the stories that, um, that have endured the test of time. Now, at this point in history, we humans are basically like kindergartners running around the, the halls of the Library of Congress, of this grand library. And the reason I use that analogy is that we're surrounded by these books, biodiversity, but we really don't know what to do with them. Um, we build forts out of them, we throw them at each other, we, we color in them, we tear out the pages and make paper airplanes and whatnot, but we really don't have any clue about the real value of information that's locked up inside these books. And that's because our ability to read is still at the C spot run level, yet we're surrounded by the genomic equivalents of Homer and Shakespeare and blueprints for nuclear power plants. Now, the sad thing is that our ability to build the card catalog of this enormous library hasn't been very impressive. If you go back over the last 250 years, which is when the start of all this cataloging of biodiversity really began in earnest, We've only managed to document about two million species, which is only about 10%, roughly, of the estimated total number of species. The problem is, we are in a race. We're in a race against time, as these two beautiful paintings by Isabella Kirkland drive home. The left picture are species that are on the verge of extinction. The right one is the species that are already lost. We're running out of time. We're losing biodiversity, faster than we can possibly document and catalog it. We haven't been able to build the card catalog of life. We need a way to dramatically improve the rate at which we catalog life on Earth. Something needs to happen there. Unfortunately, we don't know what, and we may never know what, depending on what happens next. Now, global biodiversity is unquestionably the most valuable asset on this entire planet, bar none. The information content of the Library of Alexandria was trivial compared to this library, absolutely trivial. And now people like me, the taxonomists of the world, we have the most important job of all. We are the librarians. We are the ones building the card catalog and, and uh, generating the indexes of all life on Earth. And um, we're in an interesting time in history right now because we're the first generation to recognize the impact we're having on this planet. But we're probably the last generation, very likely the last generation, in a position to do anything about it. As my very good friend and uh, TED Prize winner, Sylvia Earle, has said, our actions in the next two years will determine the next 10,000 years. So in other words, it's about time. Thank you.